We'd like to get the yield board started in about two minutes, so will commissioners please uh, come to the table? Thank you. All righty. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the American Eel Management Board, starting here on the last day of the summer meeting. I'm John Clark, the chair from Delaware, and uh, let's get right into this here. Everybody has an agenda. Are there any additions to the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is accepted as written. Um, everybody has had a chance to look at the uh, proceedings from the spring meeting. Are there any changes to the proceedings? Seeing none, those are accepted. Uh, we've had uh, no sign-ups for public comment, so we will go right into Agenda item four, which is discussion to consider changes to addendum four yellow eel allocations, and I'll turn it over to Kirby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm going to walk through a presentation that you all received back in the spring uh, of 2016. So it's going to be pretty quick in terms of uh, covering material. There will be a couple of new slides just for your consideration, but um, I'd ask that you hold any questions until after we get done with the uh, technical committee report. So just as some background, Addendum 4 implemented a coast-wide cap of 907,671 pounds for the yellow eel commercial fishery starting in 2015. There's two management triggers associated with this cap. Uh, if the coast-wide quota is exceeded by more than 10 percent in a given year, um, or if the quota is exceeded by any amount in two consecutive years, this triggers state-by-state -state quotas. So. Um, moving forward, the, the quota that the, uh, the coastwide quota the states work under is 907,669 pounds. Addendum 4 commercial yellow eel allocations use basically the average landings from 2011 to 2013 with a fixed quota of uh, 200,000 pounds. So if you had no landings in your state, you automatically were bumped up to 2,000 pounds. Um, Additionally, quota could not exceed 2,000 pounds above the 2010 landing. So prior to 2011, 2010 was set as the base year. Um, and the minimum quota uh, change had to be within 15 percent of the 2010 landings. Um, after this uh, filtering process was applied, there was a about 13,762 pounds that were left over that were then divided among the states that had been negatively impacted by uh, this process of filtering. So um, I've got up here on this slide, it's a table that's in addendum four, it's in the appendix section, and it basically walks through what each of the state's landings were in 2010, what the 2011 through uh, 2013 uh, average was, the initial allocation they would receive based on that, then their quota, and after a filtering method that was applied, what their final quota was. So again, for today, uh, this meeting, we're considering New York's proposal. Uh, the second slide here really highlights what New York's quota is. Uh, so uh, while they had approximately 4.26% of the harvest based on that average harvest from 2011 to 2013, because it was uh, much higher than what their 2010 landings were, they were bumped back down to 15,220 pounds. So at the May uh, ASMC Spring Meeting Board, uh, NEWA proposed to reconsider the coastwide cap and state-by-state -state yellow eel allocation uh, as specified in Addendum 4, um, and that motion was tabled. So after I go through this PowerPoint and we hear the technical committee report, the board will consider that tabled motion. So New York's proposal uh, highlights a number of points in which why they think that uh, allocation should be reconsidered. Uh, in particular, incomplete landings in, in New York um, were attributed during the allocation years. New York and other states now have several years of more accurate landings data, and the ASMC operating principle to use the most accurate data for management um, is what carries most of the states through the fishery management plans. Addendum 4 does not have an allocation revisiting provision, um, and New York submitted a proposal uh, for the board to discuss that highlighted four points, which was documenting, documenting uh, why New York's landings were incomplete, documenting 
how much of an increase in the quota New York was seeking, um, reconsidering the commercial yield, uh, the commercial yellow eel state-by-state state allocation, and reconsidering the time frame for revisiting that allocation moving forward. So on this slide, New York has pulled together their landings relative to those that are reported out by uh, federal dealer reports. So prior to 2011, uh, data that was queried from NOAA uh, National Marine Fishery Service commercial uh, fishing statistics database reported yellow eels to ASMFC via um, the compliance report, the annual compliance reports. New York later determined that NOAA's data did not include confidential landings uh, or data from fishermen and dealers who had state but not federal license and permits. The NOAA database also did not include landings from inland waters such as the Hudson and Delaware River, and it did not always include landings that were sold by fishermen for cash or for bait. New York then uh, concentrated their effort on getting more accurate data into uh, the AC ACCSP database that uh, is currently now available. So in walking through the New York proposal, um, New York's 2011 to 2015 harvest ranged from a low of 32,000 pounds to a high of 56,000 pounds. The average harvest from 2013 to 2015 was 40,000 pounds. Average harvest from 2011 to 2015 was 45,000 pounds. If New York's quota was increased by 24,815 pounds, it would achieve its 2013 to 2015 harvest. If the quota was increased by approximately 29,900 pounds, it would achieve its 2011 through 2015 average harvest. So uh, this table here is highlighted in the New York proposal as what the scenario would, would play out if um, in 2015 state-by-state uh, state, um, quotas were implemented based on 2014 harvest. And it shows that overall the, the, the overage um, could not be compensated uh, by transfers among states. So uh, in the proposal New York uh, circulated and was included in your uh, supplemental materials for this meeting, uh, they put forward uh, two points in terms of uh, consideration. The first is reconsidering the addendum for allocation and there are four options in that A, B, C, and D. Option A would be to stay at status quo. B would be to change the allocation based on the most recent three years of data. Uh, option C would be to uh, change that allocation based on the most recent five years worth of data. And option D uh, would be a mix of, of recent five years of data as a partial percentage and some historical landings time frame as a, another partial percentage. Now this option D was not included in the proposal, so options B and C are what uh, folks may have tables that they can reference and look at. The, the next slide here walks through what the options B and C are in terms of looking at either a 2013 to 2015 average or a 2011 to 2015 average. The second de decision point that New York brought up was uh, the timetable for revisiting the allocation. So there, were, there are three options here, options A, B, and C. A would be to stay at status quo. B would be to revisit allocation every three years and option C would be to revisit allocation every five years. So in New York's recommendation, they circulated the proposal to the board for consideration today um, and initiation of an addendum at the August 2016 board meeting. So that's the tabled motion that the, the board will take up. One other point that was raised by um, uh, Virginia regarding uh, reconciling differences in landings information uh, when it comes to looking at uh, the yellow eel fishery, there are uh, at least two, two types of reporting that need to be considered. Uh, there's, report, or there's harvester reports and there's dealer reports. Um, harvest reports account for eels that are sent out of state, sold, so they're sold to, to dealers out of state, uh, eels that are sold to dealers in state, um, as well as uh, eels that are used for either personal consumption or bait. Um, Dealer reports account for eels that are sold uh, to in-state dealers. And at the October 2015 uh, TC meeting, the TC recommended that moving forward, all states should use harvester reporting to track quota to eliminate concerns about double counting and to resolve any issues of um, uh, 
associated with personal bait. Uh, so those are some things to consider uh, when looking at reallocation as well. So again, the motion that was put forward at the August meeting was to, or at the May meeting was to initiate an addendum to reconsider the coastal cap and the commercial yellow eel state by state allocation. The motion was by doc, or by Mr. Gilmore and seconded by Mr. Borman. Um, I'll take any questions at this point uh, if, if there's any confusion, but hopefully this is pretty straightforward to what was presented back in May. Okay, questions, we have Tom Foti. If I'm understanding this right, it's similar to what happened in Summer of Flounder. When you start getting a better estimate of what, of what you're actually landing or in the recreational sector, what you're actually catching, and all of a sudden your, need, uh, your quota ex exceeds your needs because that is really what you're catching, it, instead of basically changing the, al the, over, the allocations, would it be possible just to say, we underreported the landings, it means the stock was big because we're catching more reels than we throw her out there, and wouldn't it just be easy to increase the quota to handle those adjustments because we underestimated the stock by not handling, having those landings in the first place? This is the argument I made in 2003 with, to try to help New York through the summer flounder situation, and I wonder if we could, well, we couldn't do that because it was tied with the Mid-Atlantic Council, here at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, we try to help our partners and the other states involved. And couldn't we do something like that? Which means we don't have to get into this allocation thing, just adjust it according to what they were actually landing. As we figure out, the NIMS wasn't recording what they were landing. Thank you. Can you so, Tom, uh, I'll take a stab at answering that. So, um, as was pointed out at the last meeting, to make an adjustment to the coastwide cap or the state-by-state -state allocations were, would require an addendum. Um, regarding accounting for inaccurate landings, uh, this gets to a point that uh, we're going to get into at the TC report uh, in just a couple minutes, and there's a recommendation for them on how to, to deal with that in terms of accounting for all states that may have underreported or have inaccuracies with their data. Uh, next question is Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, just wanted to respond a little bit. I don't want to take away from the, the process that we're going to look at now with the addendum, but uh, the, it's simpler than what Kirby had indicated for the case that Virginia's been making for several meetings. We've had a mandatory harvest reporting system since 1993, so what was placed into the addendum um, which could turn out to be an active quota uh, is our harvest just from Virginia waters. Uh, we may not be unique, but a lot of states have a little bit of overlap where they have harvest from their own waters and harvest from neighboring state waters as landing. So we just have the harvest. Uh, what's the impact of that? The impact of that is anywhere from two to 20,000 pounds a year if we had landings. Now, unfortunately, the landings include the Potomac River Fishery Commission because they don't have landing sites. So they're either landing in Virginia or Maryland. Um, not sure how that gets uh, taken care of or if it can, but that's really the situation. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. The next question is from Dan McKiernan. Yeah, just to clarify, is one of the um, options or, or, the, or the proposals in the proposed addendum to shift to harvested data to monitor quotas? Is that actually going to be proposed? So in the New York proposal, that is, that is not a specific option or recommendation. I've seen no further questions. Oh, um, Lynn Fegley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This isn't so much of a question. Um, I just wanted to put on the record that uh, the Maryland landings are um, incorrect in Table 2 of the New York proposal. They are um, slightly off for 2013 and 2015. Um, th 
in 2013, the landings were 539,775 pounds. That is what is in the table. In actuality, those landings were 568,199. And in 2015, the landings should be 493,043 pounds as opposed to 470,532. So I just wanted to get that on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, move on. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have the uh, technical committee report. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so uh, back in July, uh, the TC met and reviewed a proposal from New York uh, to address the quota allocation in addendum four. The harvest records that determined New York's quota were based on incomplete data resulting in potentially inequality uh, in allocation to the state. Concerns were expressed from several D TC members regarding the reporting of landings from all the states, and it was reiterated that the TC members need to confirm reference period landings in the Addendum 4 table. Additionally, there was concern that New York's revised landings could include silver eels from the Delaware River uh, weir fishery thus overinflating their need for yellow eel allocation. There are no uh, current data sets to uh, address this historical um, data correctly, but New York is working on parsing out the numbers of, of silver eels from annual landings moving forward. In the meantime, the state-by-state -state landings data will be updated and revised if need be during the 2017 stock assessment update. Uh, therefore, the TC concluded that a discussion of expanding the coastwide cap in light of the New York situation should be set aside until the update is performed. Thank you, Tim. I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce Tim. Tim Wildman is the TC chair from the state of Connecticut. Thank you, Tim. Any questions you, for Tim about the TC report? Roy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's not a question so much for Tim, but um, perhaps Steve. Steve, how would you answer the question of whether the silver eel landings were perhaps included in those yellow eel landings? Steve? Well, I think that um, New York is going to be held accountable for our Delaware River eel fishery. Um, we're going to have to count those landings. Unless we're being unless we're being held harmless for harvesting those eels, are they separate from our yellow eel fishery? I don't know. So if if, if we're going to be held responsible for those landings, I don't know why they wouldn't be part of the equation. And certainly some of them are are silver eels, and some of them are yellow eels, and we're working on that right now, trying to determine. But as you might imagine, it's 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 difficult unless the the fish are metamorphosed uh, to determine whether they're, even if they're out migrating, I mean, they may enter the traps just inadvertently in the weirs. So, um, so I just think that we have to look at this, this uh, Delaware River eel fishery uh, and include the Hudson River, the eel, the eel fishery in the Hudson River, along with our uh, landings on the coast and just that's the whole equation. That would be my response. Follow-up, Roy. And I'd just like to point out that in Addendum 4, the silver eel harvest is just limited by number of permits in New York. From my recollection, there's no reporting requirement for those silver eels in the poundage. So I take it, Steve, at this point, we, we can't really parse out from the... Uh, landings, the new landings attributed to New York for 2011 to 2013, we can't really parse any silver eels out of that. Is that what you're saying? That they're part of those landings? Go ahead, Steve. Right. Those, whatever landings we have from the Delaware River are accounted for as Delaware River. In other words, those fishermen report to us. We can tell you what those weir landings were but I cannot tell you what proportion of them were silver eels. If you want to assume that they're all silver, silver eels, that's fine, but 
we can't we can't determine at this point. We're, we are collecting data, and we are, you know, we do have people that are sampling, so we have some idea. But at this point, we don't. Pat Keller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you recall at the last meeting, I made a, a big swing and a miss about trying to include Elvers into this conversation. Um, and to me, there's a little bit of a fairness question. The state of Maine has invested um, thousands and thousands of dollars into a swipe card reporting system, very robust system to be able to track our catch. Um, we've already made um, uh, some changes to allow silver reel harvest within New York where the rest of us have given up our silver reel fisheries. Um, I, I just think this is premature and I, uh, I support at this time the TC's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. All these questions would require an addendum, as Pat pointed out, so that could be the direction we go. But at this point, are there any further questions for Tim or for Kirby? Seeing none, I guess at this point we'll bring back the question that was tabled. Okay. Um, let me turn it over to uh, Steve for New York to fill us in on their position on this now. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I think that there's sufficient um, concern around the table for improvement of, you know, the, the state's records on the landings. Uh, we heard concerns about the elver fishery. Um, New York's biggest concern at this point is that all the work that we, we put into trying to improve our reporting and, and get better information into our system is, is not going to punish us in, in this situation, in this fishery, in Menhaden, and other fisheries, you know. Um, so we are very interested in moving forward with changes to the uh, to our quota. At the same time, I think that maybe all the states need a chance to um, to, to take a crack at this, and we're not going to be able to do that until after we get the uh, the next stock assessment update in 2017. So I would mo move to uh, postpone indefinitely. If that's uh, unless uh, there's other thoughts on the matter. So this is a new motion. Is there a second? We have a second from Pat Keller. Any discussion of the motion? Seeing none. Shall we? So why don't we? Take a second to caucus and then we'll vote. Um. A question from Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am a little bit confused by what this motion will do. If I could get a further explanation so I could know what to do here. I believe what we're doing is uh, postponing consideration of the main motion um, indefinitely, which I guess means until after we've got the next assessment and have started the next addendum process. So I think it essentially kills it. Uh, is everybody ready to vote? Do we have any objections to the motion? Seeing none, the motion passes and the proposal is postponed indefinitely. Thank you. Uh, at this point, then, we will move on to agenda item five, which is to consider the North Carolina Glacial Aquaculture Plan for 2017. Uh, Kirby has a report to start. 
Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. So similar to, I, I believe, the, the February meeting, um, I'm, I'm actually going to walk through North Carolina's proposal as it was presented to the Technical Committee in July, uh, and then I will turn it over to the uh, Tim to, to provide the TC report, and if there are any further questions on the proposal, uh, I might uh, direct those questions towards Michelle uh, to, or Dr. Duvall to, to be able to answer. Um, so. So North Carolina has put forward a revised aquaculture plan for 2017. So just again, some background. Uh, at the February meeting, the board approved the North Carolina aquaculture plan for 2016, allowing up to uh, 200 pounds of glass eels to be harvested for aquaculture purposes. Um, the board's approval was contingent on two issues, that exports of glass eels would be prohibited and that the second year of the plan would be conducted uh, as a pilot program uh, where the TC would try to determine determine sampling protocols to get at estimates of abundance um, and possibly to develop a um, young of year survey off of it. So um, in February uh, of this year, North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission approved declaration ruling allowing the American eel farm to possess American eels less than nine inches uh, from North Carolina waters. As of March 18th, they were notified they'd be able to start fishing on March 21st. Uh, they officially started that day, um, and the, the following day they had an official declaration uh, from uh, the state. So in looking at the results, uh, the, the American Eel Farm was able to fish for about three weeks uh, from the last week of March through the mid middle of April. Uh, they fished five of 13 sites and caught zero glass eels. Uh, two elvers were captured and released, and it, it was confirmed that it was difficult to capture, uh, to, to catch glass eels with fike nets in coastal waters. So um, in May of this year, North Carolina DMF informed the American Eel uh, Board of its intent to submit a new aquaculture plan for a, uh, a second year program due to the late start and zero harvest. So on May 31st, North Carolina uh, submitted a plan to a Smithy staff, which was then circulated to the technical committee. Uh, I'm going to walk through next the, the major changes that have happened, um, just outlining from what the 2016 plan that the, the board considered and approved in February and what the 2017 plan offers. So um, currently the difference in the 2017 plan is that instead of starting harvest on February 22nd, in 2017 harvest would begin January 1st and go through April 30th. Regarding the fish time, um, during the, the months of January 1st through February 28th, uh, the fish nets would be done once every 24 hours, and then uh, from March 1st through April 30th, fish nets would be fished every two hours before, uh, for, or for, from two hours before sunset through two hours after sunrise. Uh, this was different um, in that previously the, the two hours before sunset and through two hours after sunrise applied throughout the entire period. This will only apply from March 1st through April 30th, whereas January 1 through February 28th is once every 24 hours. Uh, additionally, in, tw in the 2017 plan, there would be one individual on the permit uh, and allowed for, for two mates to help, whereas in the 2016 plan, there were three individuals who were allowed to fish under the permit and allowed for one mate each, so a total of three mates total. In the 2017 plan, there is an additional uh, site which includes the White Oak River, uh, whereas in 2016 there were 10 primary sites, so it increases it by one. There's 11 sites in the 2017 plan. So this map here uh, demonstrates the area of the North Carolina coast in which the, uh, the additional site would take place um, in the White Oak River. Uh, this offers uh, kind of a land use uh, breakdown of what the watershed looks like. Uh, it's mixed use in terms of residential. Uh, further up, uh, there's more um, uh, vegetated cover, uh, but it is a uh, impaired water body. So, uh, as, as just noted, uh, the White Oak, it meets the criteria of uh, Category 4 and 5 uh, impaired water body. Shellfish uh, collection is prohibited from the area, and it's a relatively small river located uh, outside of the Albemarle and Pamlico Sound um, along central 
North Carolina coast. Uh, some of the benefits is that it, uh, it would not need to use alternate sites located near the mouth of the Noose River um, and that it had been a data poor area uh, previously in terms of sampling of American eel and that there was greater fr freshwater influence in this area uh, compared uh, to w which would hopefully increase the likelihood of encountering glass eels. So in terms of uh, the new plan, I'm going to walk through the, the, the monitoring uh, components that differ in this version versus the last. So for the 2017 plan, uh, glass eel harvest at each net would be recorded out as actual weight, whereas in the 2016 plan it was estimated weight. For this revised plan, uh, the total glass eel harvest reported before returning to the landing site would be actual weight, whereas in the 2016 plan it was estimated weight. Um, and at the, in the 2017 plan, uh, elver weight would be recorded at each net, whereas there was no elver workup um, in the 2016 plan. And uh, there would be a change in terms of calculating the CPUE uh, from uh, going to a monthly uh, calculation as opposed to doing it at the end of the harvest season. Um, an important other point to note is that in terms of the monitoring program, there was a, rem uh, a change to the permit requirement, which uh, was that instead of allowing for warrantless inspections, uh, they now will not uh, have that provision on it. So uh, warrantless ins inspections and searches of gear and vessel um, and persons will not be allowed. Uh, there will also be less phone calls to the communication center reporting out on harvest and uh, a shift in the time when the gear will be uh, uh, when it will be inoperable on weekends. Um, this again just shows uh, where in terms of the uh, the likely harvest boundary for glass eels on the White Oak uh, River is. And then this last slide just provides a full summary of the changes between the 2016 plan and the 2017 plan. So uh, just to, to tee up Tim's uh, presentation and then Mark uh, Robson, our LEC reps uh, report. Um, this report was submitted to the TC. Uh, they considered it. The LEC also had time to review it and now it will be for the board to, to consider after those two reports. So I'll turn it over to, to Tim unless there's any questions at this point. Thank you, Kirby. So during our last meeting, we uh, met and discussed this proposal, obviously, and uh, uh, the TC felt that the addition of the White Oak uh, Cove as an additional site, uh, we received that favorably since there has been some previous research in this site, and that could complement the data set from the aquaculture plan and could additionally serve as a permanent uh, young a year survey site. The other changes were also accepted by the TC contingent on the following recommendations uh, that a URI survey site should be developed at one of the sites in conjunction with the uh, aquaculture plan going out in year three, which is 2018. And uh, due to the 24 hour soak times, uh, fight net mortality should be addressed during the months of January and February. Thank you, Tim. Now we'll have a report from the Law Enforcement Committee from Mark Robson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Law Enforcement Committee had an opportunity to review this revised uh, aquaculture plan proposal uh, during its teleconference call on July 8th. And we had good attendance for that meeting. Um, during the call, uh, we were briefed on the substantive changes to the permit and the permit conditions from last year's implementation. Um, and it, as you recall, the LEC had commented on that original proposal in a, in a memo of January 15, 2016. Um, during, the, during our recent teleconference call, um, our North Carolina law enforcement representative did report on the shared, shared learning experiences of the enforcement officers and the vendor in this new program. Um, as a result of our discussions, there, there really were no significant concerns or uh, or questions raised regarding the proposed changes to the aquaculture collection program as it's being revised or requested to be revised. And the LEC continues to support the plan as one that has taken reasonable steps to ensure adequate enforcement and monitoring of collection activity. 
And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mark. Do we have any questions for Kirby, uh, Tim, or Mark, uh, Bob Ballou, Tom Fody? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mark, I'm just curious, uh, the proposal to drop the warrantless search provision, um, how did the LEC review that, and apparently why were there no concerns about dropping that provision from the, the plan? That was that was mentioned, of course, as a change, and there was there was um, some question as to uh, why that why that was done. Um, it, the the general response was that it was something that North Carolina felt they needed to do, and as a result of the discussions, there were no more questions about that issue. So there didn't seem to be any major concerns about that about that change. Thanks, uh, Tom Fody. Yeah, my question was going along the same line. I mean, in New Jersey, you don't need a warrant to check anybody in the op operating the, the fish fisheries are on board. So do you need a warrant in North Carolina to, to basically search any boat that is actively fishing? I mean, that's, that's what's confusing to me. Uh, your law is different than the ones in New Jersey. Through the chair. Michelle, can you answer that? I'll do my best, Mr. Chairman. So there have been, there were some recent um, legislative changes as a result of last session that um, significantly, I think, reduced the ability of law enforcement to be able to um, board a boat and inspect uh, coolers or, you know, anyone's fishing catch. So it was an it's something that we're actually trying to get modified in a future session. I think it was aimed more at wildlife inspections, and unfortunately the way the legislation was written, um, it also incorporated Marine Patrol. But, you know, because it's statutory language, it has significantly reduced our ability to do that. So that's why this request was made by Marine Patrol, so as not to be in conflict with statute. Follow-up, Tom? Yeah, but wouldn't it be if the it was part of the contract and they agreed to sign the contract, then they're wavering their right to a warrant, and why not leave that in there? I mean, the only thing that's a concern to me is this is a fishery that can be ripe for poaching for basically because of the price per pound, and that's one of my concerns here. We have these problems going on in Jersey where we catch people doing it, perhaps in numerous states, and I always thought that this was a good deterrent. And there's no reason for a person to give up. The, they can give up their rights to do that, and all I have to do is keep it in the proposal. So that's what I'm trying to figure out, why they can't voluntarily say, because we're actively involved in this fishery that needs to be monitored in a certain way, that we support being able to be searched. Michelle, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, so again, Tom, it's a concern that anything that would be in there that would be inconsistent with the statutory language put, could put us, the division, at risk, and we didn't want to do that. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? So um, my question as a follow-up would be what does North Carolina have in its arsenal to safeguard uh, these rules that, that we are anticipating to be followed. Looks like that's another one for you, Michelle. So we do have license suspension and revocation um, rules, just, I think, just like I think most of the states do, so those would certainly apply. It's a matter of the statutory language, Sheree, that that has reduced our ability to um, board and inspect without permission. So, you know, none of the other, none of the other tools that we have in our toolbox that would um, allow for license suspension and revocation if a licensee fails to meet the requirements would prevent us from, you know, revoking a license or permit. It's just the inspection thing. Follow up from Shree. Thank you. Um, again, how would you get to that point? How, how would you know 
that they were doing anything illegal if they can't. I'll let you take that again, Michelle. So we can go to a facility and... Sheree, where's your question coming from? I guess I'm just trying to understand that because I think I've tried to outline the discrepancy between statutory language and our ability to inspect without permission. Um, and so I guess I'm a little bit confused by the question. Okay, maybe I misunderstood. How can you inspect without... Um we can show up and we can try to inspect, but if the way the statutory language is written is that if a person says no, then our officers are not allowed to open a cooler or something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rob O'Reilly is next. So I guess what I'm wondering is there are points of landing and does the North Carolina uh, changes, does that apply to the points of landing where a lot of the law enforcement activity occurs anyway? Michelle, do you want to? It's pretty broad, Rob, this statutory change. So again, if I were to come to you and say, you know, hey, do you mind if I look in your cooler? And if you say yes, there's no problem. So there has to be, the way the statutory language is written is there has to be obvious evidence of violation for the officer to do something. And I, I really, I don't have the statutory language in front of me, so I, I'm really, you know, reluctant to go into it much further. Um, I'm happy to look it up and provide it to the board if you guys are interested. As I said, it's something that I think was inadvertently inclusive of our Marine Patrol when the statutory language went through and the intent was really for wildlife inspectors. So that's something that we're actively working to modify. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, this uh, issue has obviously gotten a lot of interest. Mark, could you maybe expound a little more on why the Law Enforcement Committee did not feel that North Carolina would be hampered in doing inspections uh, because of this clause? Well, the general discussion, I think, revolved around the fact that there was still adequate um, safeguards and conditions in the in the permit itself um, as far as uh, notifications and, and monitoring of harvest collection sites that they would be able to keep up uh, keep up with the activities in that in that way thank you mark uh, next we have Richie white thank you mr. chair I guess I'm still struggling with this some because part of our approval of this plan was assurances uh, on <clears throat> uh, keeping track of this process through the harvesting and through the development at the aqu aquaculture site. Um, and it seems to me that uh, this has clearly opened the door for uh, some potential problems and I guess I'm not comfortable that law enforcement thinks that <clears throat> um, that they have the issue covered where it doesn't sound like they can do any inspections if the if the person says no uh, we're not going to know what's going on there so um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the next step is but it makes me uncomfortable that we've approved this on, on a certain basis and now that basis is not no longer available Thanks, Richie. Uh, Kirby would like to make a comment on this. Just one other point for the board's consideration. I, as I was going through the changes in the 2017 plan relative to the 2016 plan, there there is, a, a, again, a, a change in the number of permittees. There's only now one person who is operating with a permit as opposed to three before with three possible mates. So there's one permit person with two mates. So it, it actually is reducing the number of, of people that would be potentially uh, looked at to be searched or considered for this. Follow up, Richie. Thank you. Um, but what about at the aqu aquaculture site? What about at the plant? In other words, what if the, what if they just say no, no, not allowed in anymore? Uh, I guess. Michelle, would you like to respond to that? Yeah. So, Richie, I think if there is, if there is evidence, and I. 
I think officers would be looking quite closely to see if there is obvious evidence of potential violation that they can note that gives them enough grounds to move further. This, so this operation has to have an aquaculture collection permit. It has to have an, oper an aquaculture operation permit. There are conditions associated with that that would allow the revocation of those permits as well as the suspension of the license that allows for harvesting. No different than any other state. I'm a little concerned about this type of questioning at this hour, quite frankly. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, next question is Dave Simpson. Yeah, thanks. So, um, you know, thinking well beyond eels, it seems um, there's a there's a difference in North Carolina now that makes fisheries enforcement much more like, um, you know, general law enforcement on uh, roads, cars, uh, pro private property, and so forth. That that's different from the standard that I think there is universally, and I, and I wonder if it wouldn't be helpful for us for all of our plans to ask the law enforcement committee to kind of do a, re a review from, you know, NOAA fisheries down through all the states in terms of the ability to um, effectively enforce uh, ECFACMA um, uh, mandated uh, measures. Um, I, you know, it, I don't think, you know, it's fair to grill Michelle on, on you know, state law and, and the details and the nuanced differences, but I'd, I'd like to hear from law enforcement generally if um, how much consistency we have and, and if there are some areas, important areas, I mean, North Carolina lands a third of some of our species, so uh, if that's also occurring elsewhere, I think, I think we need to know where we stand for that effective enforcement of our um, ECFACMA-based regulations. Uh, Mark would like to respond. We would be happy to comply with that request, and, and I think that would be helpful to, to get the entire LEC involved in reviewing their, their current policies and statutes and provisions, and we can provide a report to you. Thanks, Mark. Next on the list, I have Tom Fody. I hate to belabor the point, but it is really a serious concern for me. I mean, one of the, the, the good options that we have in law enforcement, especially in New Jersey, is that you can go in and search any cooler to basically for whether it's some flounder striped bass and everything else. Now, if the person refuses your permission to go in there, you can still, if I'm not completely wrong, you can still give him a citation on the fish because you didn't get his permission, but you basically can't give him the citation like an Island Beach State Park, you're not allowed to have beer. So if you got beer, you're all right, because you can't do nothing about the beer in your cooler. And that's, that's one of those rules. This is actually more strange than a, a traffic cop. Tom, do you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I'm making a recommendation that we basically write a letter of concern, because this affects not only, the, as Dave pointed out, and my estimation affects the enforcement of any of the rules, whether it's striped bear, summer flounder, or anything else. If a law enforcement officer can't go in to check a cooler and, and without permission, especially when it's a fish thing. So I'm really concerned over it. Okay, Tom. Uh, next question is Dennis Abbott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Another thing that I surely didn't expect to talk about this morning. However, I'd say that the law enforcement position raises much concern with me. I can't believe that law enforcement wouldn't be, you know, opposed to this issue. I really want a better answer from law enforcement of why they th should agree that they don't have the right to look without a search warrant. It seems like that's normal practice for a fisheries person. And second to Michelle, I know you may be concerned with the questioning, but this raises a lot of questions in people's eyes. It's curious to me, Michelle, maybe you could, I know you're having problem answering the question, but the legislative person in your delegation, maybe they could go back and find out from the legislature why they would enact statutory language to protect one harvester. I mean, it seems so contrary. Maybe I'm not understanding, but it just 
really raises a lot of questions with, I'm sure, everyone around the table at this point. And I think maybe we should be looking at whether this permit should be revoked. Okay, Dennis, I'm going to let Michelle respond to that. So I think that's, Dennis, definitely misunderstanding. This is statutory language that applies broadly to uh, this is not specific to the American eel farm. This applies across all of our fisheries, all Marine Patrol officers, all wildlife inspectors. It is very broad-reaching legislation. So um, I regret that Representative Steinberg is, was unable to be here at this meeting. But this was just as much of a surprise to the division when we saw this at the end of last session. Um, I think if folks want to advocate to our legislature on behalf of making some changes, that would be wonderful. But that's something out of my control right now. Uh, follow up, Dennis. Yes, thank you. I apologize, Michelle, it's my misunderstanding. But it, it even seems like a broader problem for you in the state of North Carolina. Mr. Brady, would you like to respond further on that? Um, just some perspective, this was a law that was, a regulation, or a law that was written, or a bill that basically said that uh, wildlife officers and others could not search a cooler uh, without permission. The practicality of it, and especially dealing with, with one permittee owner, is if if a law enforcement officer was to probably come up to this individual and say, I want to search your cooler, and he said, I'm not going to let you, that would send off red flags. They can. There is a mechanism to go get permission to go search the facilities, go search coolers, but it's, it, it's just another step. So, I mean, I don't see that, that this person would be in business, refuse to let um, officers go into coolers and think that there's not going to be further action taken to uh, look at their facility and, and really ratchet up um, inspection. So, I mean, I think this is a little bit of a red herring in this particular case. It is an issue that I think needs to be addressed on a larger level that maybe the commission wants to write a letter because it does pose some issues in terms of enforcement but in this particular case I think I think it's uh, this is conversation is getting kind of way outside the, the bounds I don't see this an individual trying to conduct business with all these permits and telling the enforcement people they can't search uh, their facilities or their coolers Thank you, Doug. Uh, we have a few more questions, and then maybe we can move on to uh, making a motion here. But the next question we have is Pat Keller. I know everybody's wrapped up around the, the, the enforcement piece uh, and consent to search. I mean, every law is, every state's probably has a little bit of a nuance here. But if, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, if I can direct a question to Michelle. Um, Michelle, just from a practical standpoint, when you issue aquaculture permits, can't uh, non-law enforcement staff uh, inspect any aquaculture facilities um, to ensure they're, in, they're compliant with any other um, environmental rules and laws associated with those facilities? Michelle? Yes, we have had staff go out to the American Eel Farms facility to ensure that it is operational, that it would meet all the requirements of ensuring that the critters are going to be able to survive and you know be cared for appropriately so we have had non-law enforcement staff go out there and do that my understanding is that law enforcement was concerned about you know the constitutionality and in addition to you know this statutory language change that had occurred and that resulted in this request to remove the warrantless piece of the searching a quick follow-up from pat Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 
it, it would seem to me in a case like this, uh, and we do this all the time with facilities in the state of Maine, um, that a contractual agreement could be made um, between the applicant and the state of Maine. Um, it's, I, I know the concern is regarding the um, a, an agreement that is not consistent with, with law, um, but if it's a contractual agreement in this to ensure you're allowing inspections, uh, I'd be surprised if uh, their state's attorney general wouldn't allow uh, that type of practice to happen. Thanks, Pat. Next question is Bill Adler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Pat pretty much covered that. I was just uh, trying to figure out why uh, the conditions on a permit wouldn't say you must be ready to uh, open your cooler, basically, and have that as part of the permit. Um, and I, I'm not sure that Michelle may have said that, well, that would go against the law. So I'm, I'm, that might be the case, but I just thought that would be the simple way is uh, right on your permit, you've got to open the cooler. And uh, I thought that would, they couldn't say no. Thank you. Okay, Bill, thanks. Uh, next question is Steve Train. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm, maybe I'm just not as cynical, maybe I'm too trusting, but we're talking about the 2017 season, one person, two months, I'm assuming he's been vetted. I'm assuming we don't think he's a criminal genius is going to, you know, smuggle 20,000 pounds of alvareels out. And they've got a legislative problem. You know, this goes away in a year. I mean, it, how bad could this get? I don't mean we should let people get away with whatever, but I just think that, uh, you know, if there's no violation history and, and we say, look, this won't happen again, we need a better plan, you need this, but this is for every species in North Carolina, and we're holding up one facility that wants to try to do something because their legislature messed it up over one person for two months? Just seems a little extreme. Thanks, Steve. Next questioner is Lynn Fegley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's actually more of a comment, and I'm sort of right there with Mr. Train. Th we're talking about 200 pounds. Um, this is a 2017 plan. It doesn't strike me that it's in the best interest of these individuals to um, conduct a lot of shenanigans because they're going to have to come back in 2018. Uh, so I, I just trying to keep it in perspective um, that uh, – you know, I sympathize and empathize with North Carolina's legislative issues. We've certainly had our own share of those in the state of Maryland. So that's thank you. Thanks, Lynn. And Bob Ballou. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna. I'd like to make a comment and then offer a motion. Um, my comment is that I concur with the last two uh, comments made by Steve and Lynn. And I'm reading from the plan, and it says that. Um, this is under enforcement capabilities and penalties for violations. Uh, random inspections will be taking place at the harvest and landing sites to ensure the conditions of the permit and all applicable rules and regulations are being followed. Random inspections will also be performed at the aquaculture facility to ensure the proper records are being kept to account for all eels. Um, Clearly, there is accountability built into this uh, proposal. The proof is in the pudding that will will be back before us a year from now when we hear back as to how the permittee responded to the state's requests for random inspections. If the permittee denied those requests and we did not, we do not feel that we had good accountability, uh, to me the permit would very unlikely be uh, continued, or the program would be very likely be uncontinued for the very reasons that have been expressed today. For a one-year uh, proposal with good accountability measures built in, in accordance with North, North Carolina's laws, which is all they can do, I feel very comfortable supporting this, and I would uh, make a motion to approve okay. uh, at the appropriate th time. Thanks, Bob. I think we have gone through, and uh, the questions have moved more into discussion, so please go ahead and make a motion. Thank you. Sorry if I jumped the gun. Uh, I would move to approve the proposed North Carolina Glass Eel Aquaculture Plan for 2017. And if there's a second, I'd like to make one additional comment. Thank you. Bill Adler seconds. My one additional comment is to Dr. Duvall. It, is there going to be an opportunity for you on behalf of the state to report back to us, not only on these accountability issues, but just on the overall uh, efficacy of the program? If it's working, which of course we're all interested in finding out because we might want to be pursuing similar uh, ventures in our own states, is, is the information going to be shareable 
or is there a proprietary interest here where we really won't be able to know if it's working or not, and if so, why? You want to respond to that, Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would expect that I would be able to share that information. I mean, I think in the briefing materials and from Kirby's presentation, you've seen, um, I mean, we've certainly shared the uh, the applicant's lack of ability to be to have been able to harvest eels this year, you know, simply because of logistical conditions, and I would expect that we would be more than willing to, you know, share the uh, lessons learned, I guess, from you know this upcoming year, where hopefully there will be a little bit more success for the applicant in terms of harvest and you know anything that we have found out. I mean, I'd be happy to ask our law enforcement staff to put together, you know, a short report based on their experiences with their inspection, perhaps inspection is the wrong word here, but um, their visits to the facility as well as um, inspections at, at landing sites and their experience with the, the call-in. You know, some of those conditions have changed, um, both at the request of Marine Patrol as well as at the request of the permittee. So I, th I think, you know, that's a long-winded way of saying, yes, I would hope that we would be able to provide you a report. Probably, um, I, I'm Probably nothing that would be proprietary, obviously. I'm thinking off the top of my head here, you know, there's a 200-pound quota, so you know that there won't be more than 200 pounds of glass eels that are, that are harvested. In terms of exact numbers, I'm not sure that we would be able to give that out, but, you know, it's going to be zero to 200. Quick follow. Uh, go ahead, Bob. I'm sorry. I was just as interested in what you just responded to as I am in the efficacy of the grow-out facility. Um, that is the uh, the proprietary, potentially proprietary area that I was wondering about. Is there, because this is a state proposal, I'm hoping that the state is going to be very interested, the state of North Carolina is very going to be very interested in knowing how well this facility performs, whether the grow-out is successful or not, and then to report back on that um, as essentially a trial that you're undertaking, an experiment, whatever you want to call it. Um, obviously, there are, you know, proprietary interests in terms of the facility, but I think the board would very much want to know um, about the success of the, of the grow-out, and that's the kind of information I'm looking for as well. Thank you. Before we discuss the motion, Bob, uh, we're asked for a point of clarification as to whether your motion includes the technical committee recommendations. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I think it should, and I was hoping that maybe Dr. Duvall would uh, acknowledge their willingness to go along with those. Yes, I would like to have that motion uh, amended to include the, I think there were at least two TC recommendations. Thank you. Do you want to just review those recommendations again? Yeah, so uh, just for the board's consideration, again, we, we put these up before. Uh, the two recommendations from the technical committee were that a younger year survey be developed at the end of, the, or yet yeah, be developed at one of the sites in conjunction with the aquaculture plan in 2018, and that would be based on how well the facility performed in being able to catch and grow out eels. The second was to address fike net mortality um, during the months of January and February when the nets will only be fished once uh, every 24-hour period. Uh, there was a recommendation for the possible use of a live car uh, by the Delaware Technical Committee representative, and I believe uh, uh, Chairman um, Clark could maybe speak to that if, if uh, board members have any confusion or, or need clarification on what that recommendation is. I think because it is just recommendation and it's not specifying how this be addressed, I think the concern that came up was based on um, some fike net situations we've had where we have huge numbers of glass eels in the net. I don't believe that they're probably having that same situation uh, at some of the sites that they're planning to use in North Carolina just from uh, observation of those areas. So. I think in the general terms that it is, if it does become a problem, I think that the motion is hopefully worded broad enough that they can come up with some solutions to that if that would be satisfactory. Ms. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so 
definitely um, our staff have, have worked with the applicant. He's well aware that a Young of the Year survey would need to be developed for 2018. So yes, we accept that condition. And then in terms of um, you know, the uh, potential for mortality during the months of January and February, I would just note that the applicant is required to leave the cot ends open for a 48 hour period on the weekends. So there's, you know, escapement and follow through there. And as the chairman has indicated, should, you know, just based on where these sites are located, it's unlikely that we'll have the same issues with mortality, but um, we do have the example that was provided of uh, a live car that we could work with the applicant on should that become a problem in the future. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, can I get a show of hands of those who would like to speak for the motion? Anybody want to speak against the motion? Uh, not seeing any, uh, I'm assuming we're ready to vote. Uh, does anybody need time to caucus on this? No. Uh, so in that case, are there any objections to the motion as written here? Not seeing any. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That concludes uh, our agenda item five, and now we are just on to other business. Is there any other business? Uh, Dan McKiernan? Yeah, I was listening to the uh, New York proposal earlier and the discussion about out-of-state dealers, and it really piqued my interest. And I'm wondering if, uh, since Law Enforcement Committee has agreed to look at a report of um, the ability to do warrantless searches around, around the various states, I was wondering if we could task them with a second task, and that would be to um, compare state rules regarding out-of-state dealers purchasing quota-managed species from fishermen and the challenges this creates for tracking state-by-state -state quotas. In my state, we, we tell folks, you have to sell to a Massachusetts dealer, and we force out-of-state dealers to set up some kind of an office in Massachusetts so the records are there. But if, if fish is leaving the state and going to another state, um, I don't think it's, it's as traceable. And if that state where it's going isn't a member of this commission and, and doesn't uh, comply with all of the, the rules of the various uh, management plans, then that fish is lost. So uh, if, would it be possible to ask the Law Enforcement Committee to do that as well? With an eye on, on the EO quota, should we develop, uh, or should we institute state-by-state -state quotas with transfers? I think that's going to be a challenge. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Mark, is that something the Law Enforcement Committee can look into? I believe so, uh, although this may get into, you know, uh, areas of within each state or jurisdiction of, of how uh, commercial harvest and dealer records are kept that may go a little beyond the law enforcement division's areas of expertise, but uh, we, can, we, we can certainly ask if that's something that we can, if the uh, LEC members can do. Thanks, Dan. Any other business to come before the board? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, I just want to acknowledge receipt of a letter from the uh, Maine uh, Elver Fisherman. I, and I guess I would, my question to uh, the Maine delegation is whether there is an intent to propose an increase in the glass eel uh, harvest at some point in the in the future. I, I'm sorry, in the glass eel quota in the in the near future. Is that is that where the state is going, or how, how do we? I'm just curious as to Maine's response to the letter that the board has been provided from the Elver Fisherman. Thank you. Before I turn it over to Pat, that would have to be done through an addendum process, but I'll let you respond to that, Pat. Uh, this is the first I've ever seen this letter. Okay. Anything else? Seeing nothing, are there any objections to adjourning? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you. We'll take about a 15-minute break so folks can check out and get organized, and we'll start the policy board at about... Uh, I mean, the business session at about 9.25.